Our Old Testament lesson for this Holy Trinity Sunday is taken from the book of Genesis, the first and second chapters, and serves as the primary text for our message later. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and the fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the, in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed and its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every, to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, 
I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. Our second reading is taken from the book of Acts, the second chapter. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Israel! Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, but one uncreated, and one infinite. 
In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. is not made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as the above, the trinity in unity and unity in trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the trinity. Please rise for a reading from the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man born of the substance of his mother in this age. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by the unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. To the suffering for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day of the dead. Ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Please. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text upon which we focus our attention today is the Old Testament lesson as well as the Gospel lesson read earlier. Dear friends in Christ, 
My grandma was an artist. She took up painting in her retirement years. Now, I myself don't have much talent for art, but I have always enjoyed looking at the works of a good artist, and my grandma was a good artist. I loved to look at those pictures as she made them, as new details seemed to jump onto the canvas with each stroke of her brush. She only painted scenery, never people, but she could take a picture and bring it to life. If I close my eyes, I, I can still see her studio. It was a little room in the back of the house, a, a porch, really. It overlooked this little lake at the bottom of the hill. There she had her easel set up with the canvas on it. She had her brushes and paint laid out beside it. I used to love to go in there every time I would visit just to see what she was painting. I've got one of those pictures hanging on my living room wall. It's a painting she made in 1984 of Mount St. Helens in the, Washington, the state of Washington. She made it from a picture, a photograph taken prior to 1977. I used to love to go back there as she was making this particular painting. I, I love to go every time I visit just so I could see what new details she'd added to the picture. Was astounded as she added the blue hues of the lake, making that water look so inviting, yet knowing that it would be cold from the melting snow that filled that little lake. If you listen close, you can almost hear the splash of the trout and the salmon as they surface, chasing after her above. I marveled as she added trees with each stroke of the brush, hues of brown and green. I could smell the pines and the aspens, hear the wind as it moved through those tall trees. Listening closely, it's almost possible to hear the distant cry of the elk, the, the howl of the wolf, the, piercing screech of the eagle as he flies overhead. I was particularly impressed as the mountain began to take shape. With each stroke of the brush, it seemed like there was a, a new crevice that would appear on the mountain. Shades of purple and gray and white as this mountain rose majestically in the center of the picture. Like I said, my grandma quite an artist. We meet another artist as we read through the creation account of Genesis today. This artist paints with such beauty that all our attempts, even those as good as my grandmother, fall somehow just a little short. This artist doesn't need a canvas. He doesn't use paints, oils, or easels. He doesn't need a little room in the back of the house for a studio. He uses all of creation as his canvas. His paints are the very shades of the light that he creates. His brush is his authoritative word, a word that he speaks and creates everything. Speaks that word, moving that brush across his dark canvas, and light comes into being. Beautiful shades of red and orange, white and yellow, filling every square inch of creation. He speaks again, masterfully moving that brush across the canvas of his creation, and the heavens appear. The beautiful hues of blue that fill the sky, stretching from one horizon to the other. Once again, this master artist moves his brush across the canvas, and dry land appears. 
shades of red and brown and black that make up the soil gather together to form dry land surrounded by the waters, the beautiful blue hues that lap at the coastlines and shores. Once again, the master artist speaks, moving that brush of his word across his, his creative masterpiece. And sources of light fill the heavens. Prior to this, the only source of light had been God himself, but now he creates the beautiful, warm yellow of the sun to rule the day and the pale gold of the moon and the twinkling iridescence of the stars to rule the night. He creates each little detail with such love, such care to make everything just right. The master artist speaks. He moves his brush across the canvas of creation and the, the waters are filled with fish of every kind, every kind of creature that lives in the water. The heavens are filled with every size and shape of bird imaginable. Once again, this master artist speaks, and all the land animals appear. Every kind of creature, such diversity, such detail, all created by this master artist as he moves that brush of his authoritative word across his creation. Such love that goes into every little detail. And on that sixth day, towards the end of the day, this master artist sets aside his brush, sets aside the paints that he's been using, and instead he takes up sculpture. The creator comes to his creation, gets down on his knees in the very dirt that he has just made, and he, with his own hands, forms man. Every intimate, intricate little detail of man, right down to the prints on his fingers and toes, the number of hairs on his head, the color patterns of his eyes. God forms it all. He forms man in the very image of the master artist, in the image of God. And then he breathes his very spirit into the nostrils of man, and man becomes a living being. Man and woman, both created by God, both created in the image of God, both created for a unique relationship with God. Can you imagine the joy that had to fill this first couple as they looked out on this beautiful masterpiece that God had just created? As they looked out on it and saw that God had made everything with such Detail, such attention to detail, such love in every intricate little thing. And he did it all so he could give it to them. He could give it to their children and their children's children and to all their offspring. God made it all and he gave it to them so that for their benefit, he gave it to them to manage for him, to take care of it for him, for the mutual benefit of all creation. Such joy, such love, such peace that had to permeate every little detail. And yet we know that this picture that I have painted for you, like any picture, is only covers a brief moment in time, a brief period of history. This picture, like the picture my grandmother painted, she painted it in 1984 from a picture taken in 1970, prior to 1977. Many of you will remember that on May 18th, 1980, this picture changed drastically. 
because it was on that day at 8.32 a.m. that Mount St. Helens blew her top. She erupted with a volcanic explosion. 1,300 feet was removed from the top of the mountain, cascading down the sides, destroying everything in its path. Those beautiful trees that my grandmother had so wonderfully portrayed in her picture were leveled. That lake, that inviting lake was filled with rock and debris, ash and lava, killing all the fish in it. Over 50 lives were lost that day, along with countless elk and wolves and whatever else lived in those woods surrounding the mountain. It was as if the entirety of the brokenness of this world we live in came to bear on that one little spot of creation. Nothing was as it was before. That's the kind of picture we have for us here in Genesis 1 and 2. Moses wrote these words and gave them to Israel to give them a picture of the power and the authority of God, the power of his word. He wrote it for the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. All they had to hold on to were the promises of God. They were wandering in the wilderness, not yet in the promised land. Oh, sure, throughout their wanderings, God took care of their every need, but they were not yet where he promised them they would be. And so Moses writes these words down to give them that picture of the authority of God because you and I know there is more to this story. We read just one chapter further and we see that even though a master artist made this beautiful masterpiece and gave it to that first couple, they weren't satisfied. It wasn't enough for them. They wanted something more. They wanted to place themselves into the position of the master artist. They wanted to elevate themselves into the role of the creator. And so they reached out. And they took a hold of that forbidden fruit. And in doing so, they unleashed an eruption of epic proportion. God's beautiful masterpiece lay devastated by the sin of man. There seemed to be no hope whatsoever of this creation ever being restored to its former glory. All hope seemed lost. Nothing man could do would change any of the devastation that sin brought. Death came with sin. And there seemed no hope for ever restoring the devastation. But when the time was right, in the fullness of God's time, the very brush that he had used to make all creation, his word took on human flesh, became one of us. He came to dwell among us. He came with authority. Jesus came with all authority in heaven and on earth. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus gives us glimpses at least of the immensity of his authority. He healed with the word. Jesus spoke and the lame walked. The blind saw, the deaf heard. Through the power of his word, the demons trembled as he cast them out. Even the forces of nature, the winds and the storms and the waves obeyed the commands of Jesus. He calls out to death, and life comes again. Jesus spoke of his own death and promised that he would forever defeat death 
by his resurrection. The master artist, the creator, came to his broken creation. He came with the full authority to lay down his life for the very people he came to save. And as the creator of the universe hung on that cross, painting its brown hues crimson with the very blood that poured out of his broken and battered body. He willingly gave up his life for the very people who had so cruelly placed him on that tree. You and me. He willingly faced the volcanic eruption of the judgment of the Father that is rightfully ours. He took it on his shoulder, carried it to his cross, gave his life that he might once again claim us as his brothers and sisters, as children of God. And with the same authority he used to lay down his life, he picks it up again. And the brush that was used for creation became the brush of recreation through his resurrection, just as he promised. Jesus comes with the authority to make all things new. Jesus comes redeeming us. Jesus comes making, bringing forth life out of devastation. He has the authority to claim us as his own. He comes speaking as he did to those disciples on the mountain in Galilee. Words that reverberate throughout time. All authority and power are mine. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. I am with you always. Jesus comes to each of us with the power of his word mixed with the simple beauty of water. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he removes from us that death and decay that clings to each one of us, removes it at our baptism. There he washes us clean, <coughs> drowning that old, sin-filled, rebellious nature that would place itself in the position of God, replacing that life instead <coughs> with his own life. He comes to us now, today, in the midst of our brokenness, as we wander in this wilderness, not yet in the promised land, Jesus is here, continuing his work of recreation, of restoration. He is here with us, bringing life out of the midst of devastation. As we stand beside the graves of mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, and yes, even sons and daughters, Jesus is there. He's here with us. The only one who has authority to lay down his life and take it up again. The one who has authority over death. He is here with us, giving us hope in the midst of our grief, giving us joy in the midst of our sorrow, filling us up with his life giving us the hope that of his resurrection, giving us the promise that we will live forever with him on this earth, fully restored, always in his promise, giving us that life already at our baptism. If you remember, I told you I had that painting of my grandmother's hanging in my living room. As she was painting it, I had no idea she was painting it for me. Can you imagine the joy I felt as she finished that painting and gave it to me? I have proudly hung it in my home ever since. It's one of the first things I hang up right after the wedding pictures. I hang it up in the living room in a spot of honor where people will see it when they come. She painted it, put such detail, 
such love into every stroke of the brush. She wanted to preserve that mountain as she remembered it in all its former glory. And she wanted to share it with me. That's the same kind of picture we get here in Genesis. Moses records these words so we can see the power and the authority of God, the same God that made everything that exists through his word, continues through Christ, through that same word, to restore that broken creation, to restore everything that our sin has devastated. He brings life out of de destruction, out of devastation. He brings hope and joy. He continues to recreate his masterpiece. And he does so, so he can give it to his children, to you and me. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep and preserve you now and always trusting in the power and the authority of Christ. Amen.